Well, this is a uh, complicated and confusing subject uh, that is pulmonary fibrosis. And uh, I've tried to outline something in the syllabus, and because this is a half an hour, I won't be able to really cover everything that's in the syllabus. But what I'd like to do is similar to the uh, talk on bronchiectasis, is to show you some of the underlying pathology and uh, hopefully increase uh, your understanding of pulmonary fibrosis. If you feel confused when you look at uh, patients who have fibrosis and or diffuse lung disease, particularly interstitial disease, certainly uh, join a large group of which uh, I'm a member, uh, there are lots of different ways that we use to try to describe what we're seeing on the radiograph, and you can see this list as, as well as I, I, I can. And I think it's just sometimes a problem in knowing First of all, how to describe the findings, and secondly, whether or not any of these descriptions really have a basis in uh, anatomic pathologic fact, and whether it really helps us in terms of classifying diseases. I think there are some patterns, though, that are extremely helpful, and I'm sure some of this you already know, and will be a review, and, and hopefully uh, some of it uh, you don't already know. I'd just like to briefly review the major causes of fibrosis here in this slide on the left. Uh, certainly a common one is granulomatous disease, the two major ones being tuberculosis and sarcoid, at least in our part of the country. Certainly lo direct lung injury, the most uh, dominant being radiation therapy and uh, drug-induced uh, uh, drug fibrosis. Obviously the uh, pneumoconiosis, particularly silicosis and asbestosis. Some patients with chronic allergy and vasculitis go on to develop fibrosis, although this is not a common cause. The most common cause of clinically significant uh, diffuse fibrosis is this group of so-called autoimmune diseases. And for the purposes of uh, this discussion, I'm just going to use IPF or uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis as a blanket term to include the various types of autoimmune diseases, which are very close. Uh, they're perhaps not identical, but they're very close in their pathologic and the radiographic manifestations. Those include co uh, collagen vascular diseases, particularly rheumatoid arthritis and uh, uh, system progressive systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And the most common and by far the most common cause of clinically significant interstitial fibrosis is uh, so-called UIP, sometimes synonymous with IPF, but I'm using it here as a subclassification. And we'll try to get into the uh, controversy about whether DIP and UIP are the same diseases or different, but we'll be talking about interstitial pneumonia that goes on to fibrosis. And then there are various miscellaneous. I've just listed one ankylosing spondylitis. Now, it, it's, uh, you probably already know this, but it's important to realize that early in the development of fibrosis, one has interstitial and or alveolar pneumonitis, and there is edema, inflammation, it's both interstitial and alveolar, and X-ray CT or any other kind of imaging is going to be dominated by this process. And therefore, the fibrosis, even though it's very extensive histologically, may not be apparent radiographically. Now, there's an exception to this because some patients with IPF never seem to develop this phase. At least they, they do pathologically, but radiographically, they appear to develop, uh, they have an, a fibrotic appearance right from the beginning which may be slowly progressive or actually rapidly progressive. Uh, this is just uh, an example of one such patient. This is a patient who had received uh, radiation to the right lung from metastatic carcinoma of the breast. Uh, we see what we call interstitial pneumonitis. This is a radiation-induced pneumonitis. This is uh, within the three-month period that we commonly associate with radiation pneumonitis. Uh, she died, and her entire was end-stage fibrosis as we see here, although there is also a great deal of inflammatory process going on. So again, the edema uh, and the inflammation mask the fibrotic process, especially early in the game. Now, later, when we get to fibrosis, there are really two types. This is a type that the pathologist sees of mild fibrosis, and occasionally they will see uh, thickening of preserved alveolar walls, septa, uh, perivascular, peribronchial connective tissues. It's questionable whether this fibrosis is significant. It probably is not clinically significant. Uh, 
and it probably is not detectable by x-ray. It may cause a very fine uh, reticular pattern, but it's even questionable whether this myofibrosis uh, is detectable. And really what we're talking about is significant fibrosis, and when we see fibrosis by the x-ray, we are uh, on x-ray, CT or the chest x-ray, we're almost always talking about end-stage fibrosis. That is, there's lung destruction and replacement by mature fibrosis. Now, end-stage means it's end-stage in the air that's involved. So if it's focal, of course, it just represents a scar, but if it's widespread, as it is in UIP or some of the other diffuse uh, fibrotic syndromes, of course, this becomes significant. So we're looking at uh, marked destruction and replacement by fibrosis, not just a lattice work arrangement of uh, thickening. We'll just spend one moment on physiology of fibrosis because it does help explain some of the radiographic changes. This is uh, a pressure volume curve showing lung volumes on the left. Uh, correlated with negative intrathoracic pressure. Uh, this isn't as bad as it looks. All it says is that for any given change in negative pleural pressure, the emphysematous lung being more compliant than normal will change volumes more than normal. The normal is here. The fibrotic patient who has advanced fibrosis cannot expand these lungs no matter how hard they try. And they do try very hard. Uh, John West has measured pleural pressures in patients with advanced fibrosis and have, has found that negative pleural pressures up to uh, 40, 50 centimeters of water may be developed. Now, the lung really doesn't know whether it's receiving positive pressure, such as from uh, positive pressure ventilation or negative pressure induced by very negative pleural pressures, but the lungs of patients with advanced fibrosis are being subjected to these kinds of negative pleural pressures with their every breath. Now, the negative pleural pressures uh, combined with the increased elastic recoil of the fibrotic lung that we talked about tends to dilate the airways in interstitial fibrosis. Remember, in emphysema, because of this lack of radial traction, because there is alveolar destruction, the airways tend to collapse. So fibrosis is not a form of obstructive airway disease, and in fact, if anything, uh, airway flow rates may be greater than normal. Well, we mentioned this in the talk on bronchiectasis, and I'll just uh, say it again here because we're talking about this effect of, of traction bronchiectasis of the fibrotic lung. Because of these highly negative pleural pressures, because of this increased elastic recoil of this uh, fibrotic lung, and because the lung is contracting and foreshortening, the bronchi buckle and dilate, and this uh, forms this thing that we call uh, traction bronchiectasis. It's interesting that one sees this in areas of advanced fibrosis, but in patients who have combined fibrosis and emphysema, usually one doesn't see much of this traction bronchiectasis, uh, presumably because the emphysematous lung is more compliant and can uh, dilate rather than uh, subjecting the bronchi to the dilatation forces. This is a uh, sagittal section of left lung. This is the corresponding radiograph in a patient who had extensive uh, interstitial fibrosis. You can see the areas, uh, the darker areas here represent the fibrotic lung zones, and one can see the marked difference in size of the airways, segmental, uh, subsegmental, and sub subsegmental bronchi, which are dilated in the areas of fibrosis, but not in the more normal surrounding lung. And you frequently can see this if there's enough density of the surrounding lung, you can see this little bit of uh, traction bronchiectasis although it's very hard to distinguish this from other forms of bronchiectasis and even from honeycombing. And you can see in areas where there's marked loss of lung volume that this actually produces uh, part of the honeycombed effect. So this takes us into honeycomb lung. And honeycomb lung has been defined rather arbitrarily as cysts of 5 to 10 millimeters in diameter. Uh, I'd just like to spend a moment on this and expand on this slightly because they're really at least four causes of, of honeycombing. Uh, one is alveolar wall destruction and coalescent of the uh, dilated alveolar spaces. And you can see some of this uh, alveolar wall dissolution going on with the development of the large honeycomb space. It's also caused by bronchiolectasis, and presumably this is caused by the same traction effect that we described earlier. Uh, here's a bronchial artery, here's an adjacent uh, bronchus, here's another one here, and you can see that there's marked dilatation of the 
distal bronchioles. And so this is a second cause of dilated spaces. Third, uh, this traction bronchiectasis. And four, if there happens to be any pre-existing or associated emphysema within the areas of fibrosis, they're going to contribute to the honeycomb appearance. Now, although it's said that honeycombing equals fibrosis, uh, this is not invariably true. We sometimes see a very distinct honeycomb appearance in people who clear their infiltrate or their disease, and therefore it does not represent end-stage fibrosis. Secondly, not all cases of fibrosis have honeycombing, at least not as defined by this uh, 5 to 10 millimeter definition. Well, I think we all recognize honeycombing when we see it radiographically, and I don't have to describe this. Uh, pathologically, it has a uh, varied appearance. This is one appearance of honeycombing, and if you look carefully here in the peripheral, subpleural portion of the lung, you can see rather advanced uh, end-stage fibrosis with honeycombing, but notice that these cysts are not uniform in size, and in fact, many of these cysts are far below uh, 5 to 10 millimeters in diameter. Some of these uh, are from microscopic size up, so there's a continuum in the size of the cysts. The other thing is that it's possible to have end-stage fibrosis, and this frequently occurs, without any significant honeycombing. Now, this is a patient who was in his 50s who developed end-stage fibrosis. This was his radiograph. Uh, this is a post-mortem sagittal section of the left lung, and all the fibrotic areas of the white areas, the more normal lung now looks congested, possibly because of uh, hyperperfusion of what little lung is, is left. But the thing I'm showing this for is to show that really in the fibrotic zones, there's virtually no gross honeycombing. Now, microscopically there is, but not grossly. And finally, uh, there is no real defined upper limit on the size of honeycomb cysts. This is a patient with end-stage uh, UIP who has advanced fibrosis. Uh, all the white areas represent end-stage fibrotic lung. Uh, there are a few residual areas of uh, more normal lung, and you can see that, and, and histologically, these represent uh, fibrotic cysts. These are surrounded by fibrosis, and you can see that there's tremendous variation in the size of these cysts. Now, this, the larger cysts tend to occur in the upper lobes, as they do with any type of cystic lung disease, and it's impossible radiographically, really, to know whether one's looking at emphysema, bronchiectatic cysts, or whether these represent part of the fibrocystic honeycombing uh, process. Well, this brings us to uh, an examination of fibrosis and emphysema because even though these are entirely different disease processes, anatomically and radiologically they have similarities because one, both produce lung destruction and two, both produce enlarged air spaces. The other thing, although we frequently think of these as pure diseases existing apart from one another, there's a very high coexistence of fibrosis and emphysema. <clears throat> now, this just may be chance because both diseases occur uh, in the older population, but uh, there may be other reasons. For one thing, there's a high incidence of smoking in uh, UIP, at least, and fibrosis increases the lung stresses. Uh, the lungs are heavier, so there's more gravitational stress. This traction effect may help to dilate uh, uh, other lung spaces, and uh, negative pleural pressure may uh, dilate spaces. This is a patient who has combined emphysema and fibrosis. Uh, the fibrotic zones are more here in the sub- pleural portions, the emphysematous areas more centrally, and you can see it, it's very difficult looking at them grossly and uh, certainly uh, radiographically, uh, sometimes in differentiating the holes due to fibrosis from those due to emphysema. And when they are combined, it uh, often is a confusing picture because the PFTs may not, the standard PFTs may not reflect the dysfunction present. Uh, remember, fibrosis improves airway flow rates. Uh, emphysema causes airway obstruction, and uh, they may, in effect, somewhat balance if one just looks at tests of airway obstruction. On the other hand, both fibrosis and emphysema adversely affect diffusing capacity, and this is the best test to use because it will reflect the amount of uh, total uh, dysfunction present. Chest x-ray may be confusing because one of the signs that we look for is volume loss, and people with combined emphysema and fibrosis usually don't show volume loss because they have plenty of emphysematous lung that can uh, fill the spaces uh, left by the uh, contracting lung. As we said, the identification of holes due to emphysema versus honeycombing may be impossible, and the emphysematous picture may, may dominate. 
Now, one can often get a clue that uh, one's looking at combined disease because even though in this patient there's tremendous overinflation, there is increased density and uh, considerable volume loss uh, if one just looks at the lower lung zones. This is better appreciated on the lateral projection. I've drawn in the fissure here uh, for you because it didn't show well, but there's frequently downward displacement of the fissure in patients who have uh, combined fibrosis and emphysema because UIP is uh, at least usually predominantly uh, greater in the bases than it is in the upper lung zones. It's not invariably true, but usually true. This is the sagittal uh, corresponding uh, post-mortem section on this patient. You can see the tremendous volume loss selected to the lower lobe. Much of this honeycombing is due to fibrosis. There's also emphysema here, and you can see that most of the disease in the upper lobes is emphysema. Now, the best way to separate these out is by CT. I think the chest x-ray is difficult to know what's going on, but the CT clearly shows uh, this subpleural disease, which is fibrosis, and shows that the central portions of the lungs and all this portion of the lung has been largely destroyed by the uh, emphysematous process. I'd just like to uh, spend a moment on the anatomic types, and this in a way is an artificial distinction of, of types, but it's helpful sometimes to not, inc not uh, think of all forms of fibrosis as being the same. Uh, there is a form of dense, uh, almost monotonous fibrosis in which there's very little, if any, residual uh, functioning parenchyma, and one sees that mainly in uh, two, or, two or three states. Radiation fibrosis is probably the most common one. This is the same slide I showed earlier, where the lung parenchyma has been totally lost here and replaced by this monotonous fibrosis. The only thing interrupting the fibrosis are the residual dilated airways. We see the same thing in patients with end-stage uh, fibrotic sarcoid on occasion, and of course we see it with progressive massive fibrosis. And these are really uh, special types of this monotonous fibrosis because they're frequently nodular. So we see nodular fibrosis of the dense type in silicosis and tuberculous scars and occasionally in uh, patients with sarcoid. Most of the other types of end-stage fibrosis, the fibrosis is mixed with air spaces, and that may represent normal lung, emphysematous lung, or the various types of honeycombing that we talked about earlier. This is another uh, patient with this dense type of fibrosis, uh, this uh, being in sarcoid, where the fibrosis tends to, in the fibrotic stage, tends to be greater in the upper lobes and tends to be medial and perihilar in distribution. Uh, uh, silicosis can sometimes present a similar appearance, although the progressive massive fibrosis of silicosis, again, it's in the upper lobes, but usually it's more nodular. One can almost I always identify it as silicosis because if you move away from the areas of progressive fi or massive fibros fibrosis, one sees small, typical nodules, uh, the uh, silicofibrotic nodule. Now, these are two uh, inflated post-mortem sagittal close-up radiographs of end-stage fibrosis, at least end-stage in different areas. This is a patient who has scleroderma, on the left, this patient did not die from her lung disease, she died from heart disease. And this is the postmortem section slice radiograph of a patient who died with end stage UIP. We actually showed this earlier. Uh, Dr. Webb and Gamsu and, and others here at UCSF has shown nicely how CT can pick out this type of fibrosis and actually see the septal thickening, uh, what they've called the uh, sublobular bands, which uh, are thickened bands, which may or may not represent the walls of individual asini. I don't think anybody's shown that, but at least you see some of these sublobular bands and also the central thickening in some less involved uh, lobules. Now, it's interesting to look at the different pattern here because UIP is usually a progressive disease, uh, at least in that, in that group of patients who uh, progress. They go on to, do, to die from their disease. Scleroderma patients usually die from something else, even though they have fairly severe fibrosis. And we haven't looked at enough cases to know whether this kind of difference holds up, but in the few that we've had post-mortem correlation on, UIP appears to be a more destructive, more disordered process. And I think you can see that here, and that the septal uh, thickening here is very distorted. And these really represent islands and septia of fibrosis interspersed. 
first with areas of lung destruction, traction bronchiectasis, and honeycombing, where this is uh, histologically as well as uh, by post-mortem x-ray, a, a milder appearing form of fibrosis. Well, just to review the radiographic features, uh, we always talk about volume loss, but you know, volume loss frequently is not present, and it's particularly not present in those cases where there's some normal lung around which is not involved by the process. That would include patients with silicosis, patients with sarcoid. These patients usually don't develop significant volume loss. Patients with UIP do late in the disease, but if they're combined with emphysema, which they frequently are, they may not show volume loss. Honeycombing, we've shown, may or may not be present, and even when present, it may not be visible, uh, at least on the plain chest x-ray, although it is certainly visible on CT. And then there's a group I've listed here as the traction effects, which include bronchiectasis. Also, in late-stage fibrosis, one starts seeing dilatation of the major airways, possibly due to this increased negativity of pleural pressure. And Dr. Robbins at MGH years ago described mediastinal widening in patients with fibrosis, and he described this as being paradoxical in that it increased when patients inspired. He watched these patients on fluoroscopy, and he, he theorized that the increased inspiratory effort was uh, dilating the superior vena cava. Uh, curly B lines are said to be present in patients with fibrosis, but actually I think they're extremely uncommon. It's not that we don't see thick and septi, but they're so distorted that they don't have the appearance of, of curly B lines, so it's not a good sign. What we see are nondescript things on the x-ray, irregular densities, uh, linear, reticular, reticular, nodular, and just a general increase in uh, density. And one of the things we'll talk about is the peripheral distribution of some forms of fibrosis because uh, this is an extremely helpful uh, differentiating feature of certain types. Just to go back uh, and talk about some of these uh, traction effects, uh, this was a patient who had uh, moderately rapid, uh, in fact, he almost corresponds to the Hammond Rich syndrome, although he lasted a little longer than that. In June of 73, he was becoming symptomatic with his fibrosis, and you can see it's much more extensive uh, at the base and in the subaxillary portion of the lung, which is fairly typical, at least early, and you can see that it's uh, fairly asymmetric being greater on the right. Here he was uh, just prior to his death. He died on this admission, uh, and you can see that there's progressive dilatation of the airway, and it's interesting, the trachea dilates right at the uh, thoracic inlet in such cases, and uh, note the uh, size of the superior vena cava. Now, I really don't know whether this is traction effect or whether this is due to right heart failure or whatever, but it is uh, commonly seen in patients with uh, very advanced end-stage fibrosis. It's certainly not a sign of early disease. This is that same patient with scleroderma, and unfortunately, the chest x-ray doesn't involve all the nice details that can be shown by specimen radiography. Usually, if we don't have air spaces, uh, dilated air spaces, or even normal lung mixed with the fibrosis, all we see on the chest radiograph is a haze, and perhaps out toward the periphery of this, we start seeing a reticular nodular pattern. Uh, which I believe corresponds to areas where the fibrosis is mixed with areas of uh, more normal lung. Uh, Teresa McLeod expanded the ILO classification several years ago in an attempt to, uh, well, in an attempt to describe what everybody else was calling a reticular nodular pattern. So remember, the PQR are nodules, and the STU represent uh, linear or irregular opacities. And she introduced a combination of linear and nodular and called those X, Y, Z, depending on their size, Y being the most common ones of uh, nodules in the range of uh, 1 to 3 millimeters mixed with lines. We looked at several lungs trying to find out what actually was producing the reticular nodular appearance that we see in many patients with fibrosis. And, of course, this is not specific with fibrosis, but it's probably the most common single thing that you see in the way of densities in, on the plane radiograph. And uh, this is uh, very commonly seen. This is this patient I showed you earlier who had emphysema and fibrosis. And if you look through here, hopefully you can see uh, at least what we thought was a reticular nodular pattern or a Y pattern. This is another patient who came to postmortem. Uh, again, you see uh, not a honeycomb appearance, which is really what the patient has uh, pathologically, but has this uh, sort of haze and, and nodules and lots of lines, 
And really, uh, this is perhaps not perfect correlation because the vessels aren't inflated here, but really all you see are islands of fibrosis, areas of dense fibrosis mixed with areas of dilatation, dilated, distorted bronchi, and honeycombing, and perhaps some areas of less involved lung. On CT scan, uh, you see the same sort of thing, a re faint reticular nodular pattern in a patient with a long exposure to asbestosis. This is a 10 millimeter section. I think it would be very difficult to identify this as interstitial fibrosis, but on the uh, three millimeter cuts here, or two millimeter cuts which are not targeted in this particular case, uh, you can start seeing this mixed pattern which looks very much like we see on the pathologic specimen. So the reticular nodular pattern, uh, perhaps the reticular part of this has a basis in fact, but one does not really see the nodular component. And uh, I think we can perhaps suggest that this is due to some kind of summation effect, but these are not real nodules of fibrosis that we see in this fine reticular nodular pattern. Just one more example of the same thing, a patient that has emphysema and fibrosis, here toward the bases we see the uh, septal thickening, the islands of fibrosis mixed with areas of honeycombing. Uh, you may be able to see honeycombing here, but there's also a, a reticular, so-called reticular nodular pattern. Well, let's just talk a minute about the peripheral distribution because this is very useful in classifying various types of fibrosis, and there are only a certain number of diseases that do this. And it's interesting, we looked at chest x-rays for years and had trouble identifying this as peripheral and subpleural, and it took CT to, uh, of course, to make us realize that many types of fibrosis had this very peculiar uh, propensity to involve the subpleural portions of the lungs, or at least to be more extensive there. And then, of course, when you go back and look at the radiographs, you can see that it tends in many people to be more medial, basal, and peripheral, this being a favorite place uh, in the subaxillary portions, almost similar to what you see with chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. But this peripheral distribution uh, is seen only in a certain number of diseases, and it's the group that we described as IPF earlier, including UIP, in which it's almost invariably seen, patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis and scleroderma. This happens to be not a good scan, but it is a patient with scleroderma, uh, showing that same peripheral, subpleural distribution of the fibrosis. Asbestosis frequently, uh, perhaps usually, is subpleural, and uh, I've seen two cases of bleomycin on CT scans in which the peripheral distribution holds, although there are other cases of bleomycin-induced fibrosis in which this does not hold, so this is a, a plus-minus. Well, I've reached my 28 minutes, and I know we're over. The rest of the talk uh, really has to do with the complications of IPF, and for those of you who are interested, these are described in the syllabus. Just briefly noting them, they represent direct respiratory failure from end-stage involvement, very high incidence of pneumonia, probably because these cysts and dilated bronchi don't function well in routine uh, secretions and inflammation. Core pulmonale and uh, pulmonary thromboembolism as a terminal event is extremely common, and this is usually missed because their respiratory failure is assumed to be their disease. The high incidence of carcinoma in people who live long enough, and this has been shown both in UIP, rheumatoid lung, or rheumatoid arthritis in patients with scleroderma, and they may develop pulmonary edema as a late stage because of hyperperfusion of a reduced pulmonary vascular bed. So next time you see one of these cases, I know you'll just say, uh, there's nothing to it now. I know pulmonary fibrosis. Well, we may not get there, but if you learn something from this, then uh, I'm satisfied. I thank you again for your attention, and 